Good morning and welcome to our online worship service today at Bethel Baptist Church. We are glad that you've joined us today for worship. I trust and I pray that the Lord uh, desires to speak to you today as we worship him uh, through his word, just to encourage you and challenge you to be more like Jesus Christ. So thank you for joining us today. Let's pray and ask God to bless our worship time together this morning. God, I thank you for the opportunity to worship with brothers and sisters in Christ. God, I pray that today would be all about you, that you would be glorified through our time together in worship. Lord, that your word would just be strong in the hearts and lives of your people. We ask, Holy Spirit, that you would just move and uh, help us to understand and apply God's word to our heart uh, and to our lives. God, I pray that you would do a great work today that only you can do. And God, we will give you all of the credit and the honor and the glory for it. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. copy of God's word this morning to the book of Acts chapter 4. We're going to wrap up chapter 4 this morning as we uh, have been studying Acts. Just to remind you where we've been a little bit, Peter uh, and John were before the Sanhedrin and they they were being questioned about this miracle and they pointed boldly toward Jesus Christ. Well, the Sanhedrin, this religious council, they threatened Peter and John and they told them, hey, you need to be quiet. Stop talking about Jesus. We don't want to hear you teach or speak in his name anymore. Well, Peter and John responded and they said, we can't keep silent. We have got to share what we have seen and what we have experienced. Uh, And the Sanhedrin threatened them again and then sent them on their way. Last week, we saw that as Peter and John were released uh, from, from prison, from appearing before this religious council, they returned and they met together with brothers and sisters in Christ. And they gave a report of the things that had happened to them. You know, the things that, that they had experienced and how the Holy Spirit spoke through them in front of this council. And as they shared and gave this report, it says that all of the believers that were gathered together with one voice in unison, they prayed uh, and and called out to God. Their prayer was really interesting. As we looked at it last week and we focused on it, 
Their prayer started out by recognizing who God is. They looked at and considered God's power and God's faithfulness, God's sovereignty, his control over all things. Then toward the the latter half of their prayer, prayer, uh, they focused on and looked at how God desired to change lives, to change people's hearts and lives through the power of the gospel. And and sandwiched in between there, uh, we see a request that the early church made of God. Right. But it was really important to remember uh, and just to to realize how they saw and pictured God. They saw God as as powerful and faithful and in control of all things. And they knew that they were called to be witnesses and, and that they were supposed to make the gospel known and that God desired for them to do that and would empower them to do that. So they realized that no matter what circumstance they faced in life, no matter what came along their path of life or, or, you know, the situation they found themselves in, they knew that they were called to be witnesses and they trusted the Lord's sovereignty and his control. And they knew that it was an opportunity for them to point others toward Jesus Christ. So no matter how good their lives were or how bad or, uh, you know, how much of a struggle their lives were or the persecution that they may face, they recognized God's hand in those things and that it was an opportunity for them to point toward God and toward Jesus Christ to make him known. So uh, as they made a request and they realized and understood all of these things, they asked God, That in the midst of it all, no matter what circumstance they found themselves in, they asked for boldness. That they would be faithful to continue to point others toward Jesus Christ, to to share the good news and the hope of the gospel with others. We know that God immediately answered their prayer because it says that that where they were, the the room that they were in, the, the place where they were, it shook Uh, you know, an earthquake or something, it it shook and and they recognized God's power. And it says that the Holy Spirit continued to fill their hearts and lives and they continued, the believers continued to speak the truth of God's word with boldness. All right, we we looked at how when we pray God-centered kingdom prayers that focus on the advancement of the gospel and, and we desire to be used in that way that God desires to answer those prayers. That God wants to use us to uh, advance the gospel and the truth of who Jesus Christ is. In the early church, it's, it's been clear to see so far that God's hand is evident. That the power of Jesus Christ and the power of the gospel and the resurrection is evident. We can see that the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, this boldness that they even prayed for, it was evident. It was visible. The early church could not deny God's direct hand upon them uh, as he guided them to be the witnesses that Christ had called them to be. We see God's presence again with the early church in today's text. So if you have your Bible, Acts chapter four, let's begin reading in verse 32 and we'll read through the end of the chapter today. It says, now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold And laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. Then we have an example of this in verses 36 and 37. Thus, Joseph, who was also called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Let's pray this morning. God, I ask that you would speak through your word, Lord, that you would help us to see your presence and the power of the gospel in the lives of believers. Lord, as we look to the early church as our example, God, I pray that uh, we would be challenged to align our lives and our hearts with your word and that you would do a great work in the hearts and lives of your people individually, in families, uh, in our church here at Bethel. Lord, in our community, our nation, and all across this world. 
God, I pray that the gospel would advance and that lives would be changed through the power of the gospel. In Christ's name I pray, amen. Let's, uh, let's, let's jump right into this text. In verse 32, it says, Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul. So it, it says that, that there was one heart, one soul. They, they were all on the same page. There was unity in the early church. There was a, a singular heartbeat, if you will, uh, that, that they had the same goal, the same desire, and they were all on the same page as far as that goes. This is miraculous. Because I want you to think about the, who made up the early church. Okay, this early church, we're told in Acts chapter 2, as the Holy Spirit comes and the apostles preach and thousands are saved, these are the people that hear and believe. It says, Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians. And it goes on to say that they all heard the message of the apostles, the truth of Christ in their own language. So this is a very diverse group. It's a, a very differing and diverse collection of people that, that are believers and followers of Jesus Christ that make up this early church. They had different customs. They had different languages, we know, because uh, as, as the apostles spoke, each one heard in their own language, their, their native tongue. They were able to understand the truth of who Jesus Christ is and, and the power of the resurrection in their lives. So uh, there were different customs, different languages, different cultures. You know, I'm sure some were rich and some were poor. Some were probably educated and some uneducated. They were male and female. All right, they probably dressed differently and ate different food. Uh, it was a very diverse group of people that made up the early church. And, and all of these differences that they had, it still says, Scripture tells us, that there was one, one heart and one soul. There was unity among them, even though there were differences. You know, a lot of times we don't see that in society today. Uh, more than any other time that I can remember, society is divided and differences among people are seen as uh, divisive and ways to to drive apart. You know, um, I think about things such as uh, political affiliation or skin color. You know, uh, th there are just so many things that that are used as a wedge to drive and, and divide society today. And, and we're permeated with an attitude that almost says, well, this is what I believe and I'm right and you're wrong. And because we differ on this, we're enemies. All right. And there's a very hostile uh, uh, atmosphere within culture and society today to where differences, uh, there's not much grace there. Differences divide and, and there's no other possible response. Okay. Uh, it's really unfortunate and it goes against what we see right here in the gospel. So you may think and say, well, well pastor, you're talking about unity and you're talking about, uh, you know, division in society and, and politically and all these different things. Uh, you may be thinking, pastor, should we ignore the differences that we have? Uh, should we compromise on what's right and what's wrong? No, that's not what I'm saying at all. Okay. I'm saying that we've got to stand on the truth of God's word, but we need to follow God's word because with a relationship with Jesus Christ comes the attitude of Jesus Christ, a Christ-like attitude as we approach these differences that we have with other people. It's really important for us to remember that, that it doesn't necessarily have to be we disagree so we're enemies. That's it. That's all. That's the only option. Okay, because Jesus Christ was not enemies with the people that he came to save. Jesus Christ came to to redeem and rescue them, but but he loved them even in their sin. Okay, Christ loved them enough to make a way for them to escape their sin, for them to escape the penalty of their sin. All right. So so Christ came and he was generous and he gave his life for those that that were very different than he was. 
Jesus is a great example for us to, to think about today as we think about unity and how the early church had one heart and one soul. A lot of times I think that we have a misconception when we think about unity. We think about unity and we think, oh, well, we all need to be on the same page and we all need to see eye to eye. We all need to agree on all of these things, you know, whether whether it be in society or, or in church, you know, we, we picture unity as everybody's going to get along and, and, and have the same thoughts and the same beliefs. And, and we're all going to be uh, eye to eye on these matters. But, do you know, that's not really what unity is. Unity within unity in the body of Christ, there is beautiful diversity. We see it here in the early church from different customs and cultures and languages. You know, uh, people were, were different. And just because they came to Jesus Christ, it didn't mean that they all needed to be the same. So a lot of times the misconception that we have is, is we equate unity with uniformity to where uh, everything is equal and even and everything's the same. All right. As followers of Jesus Christ, we're not called to be Christian clones we're not called to, to all be the same, all right? We're called to follow Jesus. So what we should strive for and desire as we follow Christ is not uniformity, but it's unity. And there's a big difference there as, as we think about the unity and the beautiful diversity that there can be hand in hand in a relationship with Jesus Christ. And we see it right here with the early church. So this one heart, one soul, this this unity that was there and present that that created the environment and the relationships of this early church. What did it look like? You know, um, uh, were there disagreements? What uh, how did it how did it flesh out in their lives? This unity within the body of Jesus Christ. What does it look like? How should it be evident? How can we recognize this unity? And the early church is a great example of how we can recognize the unity that comes from a relationship with Jesus. So let's continue to look through the text and we're going to see some characteristics, some evidences or some proof of this unity that comes from a relationship with Jesus Christ and what it looks like in daily life. All right. Verse 33, it says, and with great power. The apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. So right here, the very first thing we see is with unity, there will be great power. Unity in the body of Christ, great power will be on display. All right, not in and of ourselves, but what were the, what were the apostles speaking to or giving testimony to as it, it describes with great power? All right, they were pointing toward the resurrection of Jesus Christ. All right. They were giving testimony to who Jesus was. They were sharing the truth of the gospel and they were doing it with boldness. And that was an answered prayer. Isn't that what they prayed for last week? Right. They prayed for boldness as they continued to share the beauty of Jesus Christ and the gospel. And God had answered that prayer. And we see that that here toward the end of Acts chapter four, it says that that in their daily lives, there was great power as the apostles shared and gave testimony to the resurrection of Christ and the power that is found in the resurrection of Christ. The peace that is possible with God because of the life, death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ. The payment that was made for sinful man by perfect Christ on the cross. All right. This truth of the gospel is what carries with it the power. So when there's one heartbeat, when there's when there's unity, when there's there's one heart and soul within the church. The focus and goal is going to be to be witnesses of Jesus Christ, as he called us to be in Acts 1 8. And as we're witnesses, we're going to speak to and tell and share the good news of the gospel and the hope found in the gospel. And when we do that with unity, without selfish ambition or anything else, there's going to be great power. We see it right here as the apostles shared. They speak to Christ's beauty and power. And that he is the only way of salvation, the beauty of the gospel. Let's continue on and we'll see another characteristic, another evidence of unity within the body of Christ. Verse 33 says, 
And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and great grace was upon them all. So with unity, when there's unity, there will be great grace. So we see there will be great power. And secondly, there will be great grace. So think about the differences with customs and cultures and language and, and everything else, daily habit and routine within the people of the early church that had come from, from uh, far and wide to Jerusalem and had, had heard the truth of Jesus Christ and had trusted in him. Think about the diversity within that group. Instead of those differences dividing, instead of looking at someone who, who was different than you or spoke a different language than you, that was not divisive. But there was a gracious spirit. There was gracious cooperation. Because with this great grace comes the wisdom to navigate through those differences and those diversities. But not only to navigate through the, the diversity, but also to celebrate that diversity in the reflection of God's glory and Christ's beauty. OK, you may think and say, well, I mean, you know, that's kind of tough. That's kind of hard. Uh, people that are different than us. But but let me tell you, the book of Revelation says that there are going to be people from from every nation, from every tribe, from every tongue with different cultures that are going to gather at the foot of the cross. And it's going to be beautiful and it's going to be grace upon all of us, just like the early church here. As we meet together and we are able to celebrate the beautiful diversity of the body of Christ as followers of Jesus, we're going to be able to celebrate that in reflection and in light of God's glory and the truth of the gospel and the beauty of Jesus Christ. So we've seen that, that this unity will be made uh, manifest. It'll be seen and evident through great power, through great grace. There are two more ways that this unity is going to be seen in verses 34 and 35. Verse 34 says, There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. So when there's unity in the body of Christ, great power, great grace, but also that we see right here, great generosity. All right, there's gonna be unselfish giving and sharing. Christ is our perfect example of, of unselfishness, of laying uh, himself aside. Paul talks about it in Philippians chapter two, and he says, have this mind in you that was also in Christ Jesus. Don't look out only to your own interests, but look also to the interests of others. And that's what, what uh, Luke is writing about here in the book of Acts as, as he talks about how the church rallied together and as anybody had need, they sold what they had and laid the proceeds, those funds at the feet of the apostles so that it would help uh, and could be distributed to any brother or sister that had need. You may think and, and say, Pastor, that's a picture of communism. But no, it's not, because I want you to think for just a moment with communism, there is an external force, the government that mandates and dictates. There's an external force that says what's yours is everyone's. And it takes away. But that's not what's going on right here. OK, the, the picture of the early church and and prayerfully the picture of our church and generosity that takes place because of the gospel is completely different. Communism says what's yours is everyone's Christianity. There's an inner force. OK, so it's not an external force that mandates and dictates. It's an internal force, namely the Holy Spirit that enables believers to say what's mine is yours. Instead of what's yours is everyone's, Christianity says what's mine is yours. And it's it's a willingness to give away of ourselves for the good of other people and for the glory of the Lord. What motivates this great generosity? We see it right here at the end of verse 35. It, it talks about how it was laid at the apostles' feet and was distributed to each as any had need. The motivation is love. 
All right, we see that in, in a distinctive characteristic of unity within the body of Christ. We've seen great power, great grace, great generosity, but also when there's unity in the body of Christ, there will be great love. We see it right here. That was the motivation toward uh, their fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. When they were able to meet needs, they tried to meet those needs. And Jesus spoke of this. Jesus said that this was going to take place and that this would happen in John 13. Jesus said, I give you a new commandment that you love one another just as I've loved you. You are to love one another. And then listen to this. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So that's a mark of the unity that we have in in a relationship with Jesus Christ, with fellow brothers and sisters in Christ because of the gospel creates this generosity. But it's motivated and founded by the great love that we have for one another because Christ is our example. So we've seen this this unity and how it, it fleshes out as one heart and one soul in the early church. But, you know, that same unity should be found today should be found in followers of Christ as individuals and as churches here at Bethel. We should have that unity in the body of Christ. All right. That one heart and one soul, that that singular heartbeat. Not that we're clones and we're all alike and we're all the same, but we can celebrate the differences and diversity instead of dividing. You know, there's grace there for those things. But that singular heartbeat, that singular goal is the advancement of the gospel of Jesus Christ. They were unified in wanting to make Jesus Christ known and to shine a spotlight on God's glory and who he is and on Jesus Christ as the savior of the world who's exalted and seated at God's right hand. That same unity should be seen today in our church and it should be seen in great power, in great grace in great generosity and in great love, all right? That's a a barometer. That's a way that we can measure and gauge our unity and whether or not there is true and genuine unity in the body of Christ. So then in the early church and now today here at Bethel, where did that unity come from? What was the source of that unity? You know, did this group of believers, did they get together one night and just say, hey, you know, we, we need to focus on unity. We ought to be, we ought to, we ought to have unity. You know, we ought to, we ought to work toward a greater unity amongst ourselves. You know, we shouldn't let the differences divide, but instead we need to, we need to really strive and work for that unity. No, not at all. I want to remind you of a couple of verses that we've seen already here in Acts chapter four. Remember when Peter and John were before the Sanhedrin, this council, It says that the council recognized that they, Peter and John, recognized that they had been with Jesus. And that's the indelible mark that Christ leaves on our lives. When we come to a a relationship with him, it changes us. It transforms who we are. The gospel washes over us and, and we are different people. The Bible says we are a new creation. And because of that, because of that indelible mark that Christ makes, the power of the gospel, that's where this unity in the body of Christ comes from. The power, the grace, the generosity, the love, it comes through a relationship with Jesus Christ. But also, I want to remind you of Acts 4.31. That was in last week's text. And it says, after the believers had prayed together, all right, it says that the place shook And they were continued to be filled with the Holy Spirit. As followers and believers of Jesus Christ, we each have the Holy Spirit that lives within us and walks with us every step of every day. Because of that relationship with Jesus, we have God's Spirit that dwells within us. And it should be the source. And it should build and grow and knit the hearts of believers together to create that unity. It's not anything that we can manufacture. There's no way that we can work hard enough to bring about that unity in our own lives with other believers, uh, within our fellowship here at Bethel. Uh, We can't manufacture that. That is a grace and a work of the gospel and the work of Jesus Christ in our hearts and lives. 
I love the way that A.W. Tozer explained this. I want to read you a quote from Tozer as he talked about the, the unity within uh, and among believers in Jesus Christ. Tozer says, Has it ever occurred to you that 100 pianos all tuned to the same fork are automatically tuned to each other? Think about it. A room with 100 pianos and there's one tuning fork that sets the standard. All right. And each one of those pianos are tuned to that one fork. All right. He says they are of one accord by being tuned not to each other, but to another standard to which each one must individually bow. So in the same way, 100 worshipers met together, each one looking away to Christ. So not looking to one another, not trying to manufacture and build unity, but as, as believers meet together and live life together and their eyes are not focused on each other, their eyes are focused on Jesus Christ. It says each one looking away to Christ are in heart nearer to each other than they could possibly be were they to become unity conscious and turn their eyes away from God to strive for closer fellowship. Where does the unity come from? It doesn't come from loving one another and, and compromising with one another and sitting around the campfire and singing Kumbaya. No, because we're sinful people. And those differences, the diversity, will eventually cause division and drive a wedge between. So when we try on our own, in our own strength and power to have unity within the fellowship of the body of Christ, we're gonna fail miserably. But when we take our eyes off of that unity and we each individually put our eyes on Jesus Christ, our Messiah, the Savior, and we submit our lives to him every day because the Holy Spirit is within us and we surrender every day to the Holy Spirit, all right, we, we crucify ourselves and we continue to preach the gospel to ourselves every single day. We remind ourselves of the desperate need that we have for the gospel and for it to continue to transform our lives. And our eyes are fixed and focused on Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. When we follow along and we submit our lives to Jesus Christ, we're going to be like those 100 pianos and we're automatically going to be in tune. The unity will automatically be there because we follow Jesus Christ. Do you have unity with others? All right. Within the church, but even outside of the church with others in society. Do you view a different political opinion as your enemy? Or maybe uh, somebody who, who just morally you know, makes, makes choices different and has different beliefs than you. Do you see them as uh, antagonistically as an enemy? Jesus Christ wouldn't have because Jesus Christ went to the cross to die for them. All right. Our culture has ingrained within us to see differences and let them further and further divide. The gospel of Jesus Christ says, look to me. Let me be your example. And as Christ likeness rules in your heart, it's going to produce one heart and one soul to where, yeah, there's still going to be differences, but there's going to be grace. All right. And there will be a Christ like attitude as you continue to try to shine the light on Jesus Christ in the gospel and unity will come about. All right, Bethel, I pray that that there would be a miraculous and glorious unity here within our fellowship. But it's only going to happen. It can't be because we try to be unified and, and to have unity. It's only going to happen when we lift our eyes away from one another and point them on Jesus Christ. When we do that, that unity, that, that one heart and one soul is going to come and it's going to be evident. We're going to be able to see it. We'll see the power of the gospel at work in our lives will be witnesses and lives will be changed for God's glory by the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. God, I thank you so very much for this picture of unity that we have in your word. Lord, I know far too often when I differ in opinion or thought or 
anything else with others. It can be seen as a barrier or as a wall. But God, I pray that you would would help me to have a Christ-like approach and a Christ-like attitude. And instead of seeing those things to divide, God, I pray that there would be grace, that you would continue to give me boldness to speak to the power of the gospel and the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. God, to, to offer and extend the hope of the gospel to those who are far from you. God, I pray that you would help me to be generous and loving God, not just to those who love me back, not just to those people that I like, not just to those people that I agree with, but that God, you would help me to be like Jesus Christ and be generous and loving to all. God, I pray that you would build and grow within our hearts a burning desire to be witnesses for Christ, no matter where we go or what we do, Lord, that we would always be pointing toward him and toward you. God, I pray that that through your Holy Spirit, you would do a great work here at Bethel, that above all else, we would make Jesus Christ known and that it would be evident in the unity that we have here together with one another. In Christ's name, I pray. Amen.